Hey guys, it's Hannah and Alex back here with another episode of... Does this podcast have a name yet? I've generally just been calling it Getting Better. All right, Getting Better podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And today we're going to talk about something pretty near and dear to our hearts, which is making the transition from class three to class four. Do you want to talk about our training camp program a little bit, Alex? Sure. So, you know, we are always trying to figure out different ways to give back. We're very community centric and both of us are pretty well and sick of teaching role sessions and taking baby ducklings down class one, two. But we really enjoy uh, teaching people who are ready to step up to class four, taking down their first waterfalls, that sort of stuff. So we see in our clinics a lot of people struggling with both the physical elements of stepping up, the skills related things, and also the mental game. So we're currently in the process right now of putting together the schedule for this season's training camps. Uh, Hopefully we'll be releasing that soon-ish, but we figured in the meantime we would make this podcast episode for people who might be thinking about coming out so they can know maybe a little bit what to expect, and more importantly for people who can't make the drive out to the Moose but are still working on this class three to class four transition. So let's start with the basics. What's the difference between paddling class three and class four? Can you define the difference between a class three and a class four rapid and what the implications are in a paddler's skill set? Okay, so first of all, I don't want to rehash the technical definitions. So we have a video that does that. We will pin the top comment with a link to that. Functionally, the difference between paddling class three and class four is using the same fundamental skills, but instead of kind of free form, willy nilly cruising down the river, you need to execute certain moves at certain places because there is something that can hurt you if you don't do what the river is dictating in the right time, the right place, the right way. I guess the big question that we'll be answering for the rest of the time is what all goes into preparing for that transition. So when I see people asking for advice like on Facebook and stuff, what I'll often see is some of the first comments in that thread our answers in terms of like fundamental skills. So people saying you should have a 90% roll, be comfortable ferrying, have a 50% booth, stuff like that. We're gonna talk about how that's certainly not the full story, but what are the fundamental nuts and bolts skills that you think a paddler should have to be successful transitioning from class three to class four? You know, we sort of sum this up with what we tell people we expect for them to show up to one of our clinics, for example. So. We definitely say that your role needs to be completely reliable. Uh, We do not expect to be fishing swimmers out. No one should be in class four. Swimming should be very rare. We expect you to have all of your fundamental skills. So that would mean that you're completely comfortable in class three, coming in and out of eddies, doing big ferries. You're learning your booth. Hopefully you're, you know, really focusing on that. More than anything, the thing that we see people showing up with lacking that will generally improve your boating across the board is actually knowing how to drive your boat, right? Establishing a really good forward stroke cadence that allows you to smash into things with confidence. So that means that you can paddle at 80% of your capacity with your bow not wandering more than, what, three, four inches off straight. And, uh, you know, when you take a right stroke, it goes left. When you take a left stroke, it goes right. We want your boat going basically dead straight and fast. So when we put out these training camp things, as you mentioned, we say that people should have these fundamental skills, but we also give people some recommendations about what kinds of gear they should have. What kind of gear do you think is really important for someone stepping up? Listen, everything has been run in every boat. That doesn't mean that you should do it. This year, for example, we had a bunch of raft guides who were running around in late 90s, early 2000s creakers. Have we paddled all of that stuff that they were showing up to in those boats? 
Yeah. Uh, have we done it in 15 years? No. Why? Because there's much better gear out there to do it with. So for starters, a modern creek boat that is properly outfitted is just going to make your life so much easier. A proper paddle also going to really make your life easier. But when it comes to what you absolutely have to have, you absolutely have to have the proper safety kit. We want to see you there in a rescue PFD, knowing how it works. Rope, know how to use it. Proper helmet, full face if you're feeling nervous is always, you know, a good little safety blanket. And we really expect everything to be in good shape. Um, that is just your minimum obligation to yourself, the people who care about you, and your crew. How do you feel about half slices for someone stepping up? I completely understand if you're someone who is paddling a lot of class three, a lot of class three releases. So it's just the same thing every single day, one and a half slice, especially in this climate where like, that's what the cool kids are rocking. But if you're going to show up to a class four and expect someone to help you get you down, and you're gonna just be floundering around, don't expect a phone call the next time they're going out. Bring a creaker and be there equipped for success. Yeah, and I think it's important to say too, I mean, we post a lot of footage of us doing silly things in half slices down the moose, but we didn't learn to paddle the moose in half slices. That came after we were already comfortable there in creek boats, right? Absolutely. I didn't start half slicing until I already knew I could smoke all of those lines. If you show up and you're already that far behind the eight ball, you're putting pressure on everyone else. It's just a selfish move. So going back to this theoretical comment thread of someone asking how to step up from class three to class four. Another piece of advice I often see is people saying, oh, that's pretty easy. You just have to practice paddling class three like it's class four. And to me, that's really frustrating because it's like, I'm a class three paddler. I don't really know what class four is yet. So can you break down what that actually means? Yeah, if that isn't just the most classic answer, right? Like, what does this mean? So we've identified these skills. There's probably a couple others, but let's just start with these skills. What this means is you are going to go out to the hardest piece of white water that you're currently comfortable on. Like really, you know, comfortable on. Should be class three. Maybe there's a class three plus on there somewhere. You are going to not just figure out how to be plotting your way dead straight down it and survival boating, okay? You're going to start saying, there's a big rock here, there's a micro eddy behind it. There's a big eddy there. You're gonna start identifying individual features and then figuring out what moves you can do with each one of those features and start doing those. Then you're gonna start figuring out how to link them all together. So you're going to make this rapid increasingly complex. You're going to add variety into this and you're going to start critiquing yourself. This is where the rubber hits the road because if you just decide that everything that you do is awesome and you're God's gift, you are not going to get better. Promise you. You are going to be absolutely gobsmacked when you get worked in a hole or miss your line because either you weren't actually challenging yourself or you weren't effectively identifying your own weaknesses. So doing this is what people mean. What I would add to this is no more freebie rapids. So when I was really focusing on getting smooth dialing in my techniques. When we were just moving through the boogie water, I was basically going through the motions that I now go through when I'm reviewing boats, trying to put my boat into a situation and just to see how it'll react. If I hit this diagonal wave at this angle, will it punch, get taken away or spin out because I gave it too much angle? Those basic sort of 
action reaction experiments are dinky, but they have really good learning implications for you. It also is going to teach you to hit things with speed. That really is the other aspect that seems to be missed for most people when they go through this process. It is not enough to just really slow windmilling your strokes, catch like 47,000 eddies, or surf as many little green waves as you can going down the river. That's the way that I was taught. It doesn't really do a lot especially now that we're paddling these nine foot boats, you want to be able to do these moves with a bit of authority. You want to hit stuff hard and fast because ultimately when we move into class four, we're going to be doing things on a timeline. We're going to be doing things probably in pushier water and you're going to be doing them nervous. So getting there faster with confidence is going to make everything else easier. Yeah, all of that is certainly really great advice. I just wanted to come back to something that you said about linking moves. That was definitely something that I wasn't expecting when I stepped up from class three to class four. What was it, like three seasons ago now? Right. Yeah, I found that there was a lot of mental game that came along with that. You know, one of our classic rapids on the moose is double drop. So as the name implies, there's two, really three moves to make. You have to do a little boof, then you have to do a ferry, and then you have to do another little booth. And in my mind, I was just always so terrified, like, what happens if I miss that ferry? There's still another move. Right. So this is confidence in your fundamentals. This should essentially come along the way. What you're doing through this repetition is basically locking in that skill. It's the same be if it skiing, learning to drive a car, whatever it is. Think about the first time you got behind the wheel of a car. You were terrified, right? I remember learning to drive stick. So having to go up a hill, having to start at a stoplight on a hill, all of those things were terrifying, right? And then a couple of years later, didn't even think about them again, right? Oh yeah, we have to go to the grocery store and there's a left turn up a, at a stop sign on an incline. You didn't even think about it. So putting those things together, even though they're scary now, the exercise in and of itself, you will lock in those skills. Well, I think I can really add to this conversation because as I was stepping up, it's what I really struggled with is talking a lot about the mental game and the things you can learn along the way to set yourself up for success in terms of confidence. So the big thing that I really struggled with was the idea of accepting risk. So suddenly in class four, we start using the scary S words, uh, which sieve, siphon, strainer, you know, they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're just kind of realities that you have to live with. And the first couple times that I went up and scouted a class four, I was just sort of shaking in my boots. You know, it looked so ugly. It was like, there's this disgusting sieve thing right here. And my brain would just short circuit and I couldn't get past that. So what I really want to talk about is how to practice getting around that and having that initial feeling not be so intimidating. So the first thing I found I really had to learn was how to scout more properly. So when I was scouting in class three, I mean, first of all, a lot of times when you go down class three, especially with a crew that's better than you, you're not really scouting. You know, they'll tell you a couple words, vomit down the middle, stay left, whatever. Or if you do scout, you're looking for a big green tongue, something that's really easy, it looks friendly. And in class four, you suddenly don't have that crutch anymore. There's a big ugly thing somewhere in the rapid. And you have to practice looking for the way around that. So to me, I suddenly had to learn how to pay a little more attention to things like how much water is going over to the big scary thing. How fast is that water moving? If I get knocked over here, do I have time to roll or am I going to hit the big hole upside down? That kind of thing. Another thing that I had to learn in terms of scouting was learning how to look at a rapid with fresh eyes every time. So when you first start running class four, you're not going to run every class four rapid because some are harder than others and you're going to walk some of them and that's okay. But even the ones that you're walking, you should take a good hard look at and try to have fresh eyes with it every time. 
don't fall into the trap of what I call walk inertia. There were rapids that I was walking for a really long time, even though I definitely had the skills just because I wasn't looking at them again with the new skills that I had learned through this process. Do you have anything to add in terms of scouting, Alex? Okay, so a lot to unpack there. I will try to find and put a link into a TED talk that Steve Fisher gave. Um, he does a really good job of explaining that when you look at a rapid, what you want to do is look at the things that are actually going to hurt you, actually limit your travel, the, the, the no-no places, let's say. And once you can say definitively, I know I can make sure I don't go there and you take out the negatives, right? You, you kind of draw out the spaces that you're not going to go. Then you can look at the positives. What are the cool things that are left in the rest of the river? So one of the things that I certainly wish that I had done when I was learning or you had done when you were learning, you know, you were running massive big water um, and yet never scouted any of it. Right. I mean, who gets out and scouts class three? Like in theory, oh, everyone should, but no one does. So it would be really helpful in this process, I think, to like just take two seconds to stand up out of your boat and take a look at whatever the biggest class three you're running is and just have that from a frame of reference going forward. Because one of the things that you definitely just do for the first time when you start actually scouting is kind of get rejoined with the power of the river that you've kind of started taking for granted again. You've gotten desensitized. And this really will peel it back and make it fresh again. That being said, you definitely have to learn how to get a sense of timing also. So you can delineate these areas where you don't want to be, right? Sometimes some rivers like Double Drop you, you use, there's foam or something like that. You can really watch something float down. Uh, paddling in the fall, you have leaves. You can spot a leaf going through. This is where the old stick test method comes from, usually kind of like a class five thing, but like if you don't know how long it's going to take for something to go through, go find a stick, throw it up there, get a sense of time movement. Because it's not just about where you can and can't be sometimes, it's how fast you have to get from point A to point B. Most likely, you're nervous, your adrenaline's starting to open up a little bit. You're probably going to convince yourself that you have to be 17 places at once, and you really don't. And I don't mean that in a catch an eddy sense. I mean, in a, you need five seconds to get somewhere, you have 30. So slowing it down, trying to keep perspective, that's going to be most of it, mm -hmm. right? In and of itself. Then we actually get to the skill portion of it. There are plenty yeah. of, like you said, the easier class fours where all you're doing is getting from point A to point B to point C without going in bad place one, bad place two. Yeah. And I think that also helps in terms of like perspective. So something that I didn't understand when I first started running class four was some of these rapids, you know, you were past the bad place in the entrance. Like, yes, there were still things you could mess up the rest of the way down the rapid because it's still a pretty technical rapid. But from the first four or five paddle strokes, you may have already cleared the bad place. So you have to get really good at really understanding what the crux is and where the danger is. It's like, OK, I can swim the bottom of this thing. Sure, that's embarrassing, but it's still safe. Right. That's definitely true. And part of that, I think that helped, too, was watching other people run these rapids ad nauseum because eventually, I mean, you and the rest of the local boater crew are super smooth, but eventually someone's going to mess up and it'll still be okay. 
but you have to understand where you can and cannot mess up. Ooh, okay. I'm going to push back a little bit here because my absolute pet peeve is the person who wants to watch X number of people run something and then decide based on other people's experience how it's going to be for them. And this goes both ways. This goes for people who say, oh, that dude smoked that line. I'm going to smoke it too. You have no idea who that dude is. Oh, this dude ate it over here. I don't want to go that way because a person ate it over there. There's nothing to do with it. Again, if, if you're going to watch other people do something, I would focus on the amount of effort they're putting in to making the move. I mean, physical effort. How hard do they have to paddle? Use them uh, in lieu of the stick method to say how fast is something happening and really limit the amount of data that you're taking in from it. Really couch it. Yeah, I do think it goes both ways. So we talked a lot about scouting, but something else that I found interesting when I made my transition to class four is that suddenly in class four, there were a lot of places where you can't scout a rapid. Maybe you're in a gorge, you know, and I really want to have eyes on that thing, but I can't. And that is a super intimidating feeling. So I think another skill that a lot of people don't talk about, but something that's really important when you're stepping up to class four and even more so when you're stepping up to class five is learning how to take verbal beta and learning how to follow someone in situations where you can't scout, but also not being entirely reliant on that and being able to read and run it yourself at the same time, if that makes sense. Right. So another thing that drives me crazy is when someone says, oh, I'm not running a rapid, a run without this person or people who are better than with me there. You need to be self-reliant, both for yourself, for the rest of the group. You know, a, a group can get down the river with everyone knowledgeable, worried about one member, but the whole group can't make it down if everyone's worried about everyone else and what they're doing, not what the individuals are doing. Definitely, as you get better and better, you are going to be expected to just cruise down harder and harder white water. It's true. Like if, if you're out in a crew and you're running class four, you know, with a class five, you aren't going to be expected to be worried about the class three rapids in there, right? You're just going to blow through them. Some of the class fours, you're going to get brief verbal and roll through. Following is a skill unto itself. So one of the things that you should be comfortable doing is just read and run and following. And that is something that you definitely should have figured out in class three. Um, for me, I know usually the dynamic is I'm leading. So when I am expected to follow, usually when we travel, people want to take us to whatever their local run is and they're super stoked about it. And they usually also want to seem to show us the hardest lines. That often means that we're just following people down the main. <laughs> and it definitely can be pretty uncomfortable rolling into the unknown, but you have to just have that level of confidence. Mm -hmm. So, and, and definitely in yourself, but in your crew. Yeah. And this is also something that you can practice in class three. I mean, you mentioned traveling. A lot of people could come up here to the black or the salmon or something if you don't live in this area and practice following, practice reading and running. It does require traveling. And ideally, you'll also practice these skills with the crew that's going to take you down class four. So you kind of know their style of verbal beta, when they're going to tell you just to follow when they're going to expect you to be on your own. Yeah, there's the saying you only get to run something blind once. Kind of implied in that is making good decisions versus bad decisions. But running stuff 
blind when there's a low chance of risk is never a bad thing. Even if that means sometimes that you take the opportunity to let other people scout and you intentionally don't just so that you follow. This is a skill. Just like the other building blocks we talked about, you need to keep it sharp. Is there anything else you have to add to the mental game of running class four that we haven't talked about? Yeah, the biggest thing that is missing in this entire conversation when people just say, you know, do this, do that, is that very often you're working on these skills with no backstop, no consequence behind you. So if you, for example, are going to show up to the moose and we're at low water going to teach you a scary ferry, it's going to be a scary ferry. There's going to be a hole behind you, you know, and that's one of our favorite things to do is to start the day by making you uncomfortable doing a simple thing because it demonstrates to us not only what your skill level is, but what your mental fortitude is. How hard are we going to be able to push you today? Um, So the only way to build that is to do the same thing to yourself. So find those opportunities to not only make moves, but make them in the worst place in the river. You don't have something mastered until you can do it on demand in the worst place imaginable. So take that attitude forward. If you don't have it dialed until you can do it in the worst place. Something that you were touching on a little bit in our earlier conversation is group dynamics, which is another very important aspect of stepping up from class three to class four. So can you talk a little bit about what your ideal crew should look like and how group dynamics should be playing out to best support someone who's stepping up? Yeah, I mean, like one of the answers that you see a lot from people, regardless of what the sport is, is, oh, if you want to get better, you need to be around people who are better than you. You know, when you're playing a sport or you're skiing or whatever, there probably isn't a big impact on the rest of the group if you're the weak link, but it really has a different implication on the river. So if you are going to be the weakest on the trip, you really need to pull weight everywhere else that you can. If you gotta go full soccer mom and bring takeout snacks and all of that stuff as a way of saying thank you, then do it. Uh, we certainly had a paddler up on the Ottawa that was doing that with her crew. And like, they maybe had to bail her out for an extra swim here or there. But when there were cookies at the takeout, no one cared about that anymore. So those little things. Definitely the other side of it that you're going to see is you're going to see whole crews rolling up to class four together for their first time. Uh, If you can find even one experienced boater to come with you and kind of have a little bit of knowledge, um, a little bit of perspective, that's going to be huge. But if you're going to do that, if if you and your crew just don't have access, please, for everyone's sake, go out and take a rescue course first. You need to be able to perform basic rescues, be that a live bait scenario, foot entrapment scenario, whatever that might be, that's huge. Like having your rescue ear with you is not enough. You need to have all of the skill set and be comfortable with it in any one of these class four and class five rivers. Mm -hmm. Something I wanted to talk about a little bit more too is I guess the psychology of being the weakest link as someone who was the weakest link in our paddling group for a couple of seasons there. There are also things that you can do to assist yourself to make sure that everyone's having a good time. So like for me, if there was a day where I knew I was going to be walking a particular rapid, I would sprint up ahead of everyone in the flat water, get out of my boat, get my walk started so that no one was waiting for me. Another thing that is pretty good etiquette. It's crew dependent, but for the most part, a good idea is making your decisions about whether you're going to walk something or run something pretty quickly. So it's fine if you're going to scout, but don't stare at something for 20 minutes, let everyone go and still be deciding. 
you should get up, you should look, and maybe within 30 seconds to a minute, maybe watch the first two people go, and then you have to make your decision at that point. Yeah, I really like the two-minute rule. You'll hear that one a lot, too. And there's a lot of truth to it. For most, in two minutes, you know everything you need to know if you are going to run it, right? You might have a question or two, but you should have made a decision and game plan in two minutes. There are certain people out there who are the exception to the rule where I've seen them stare at something for 10 minutes and it's been like, oh my God, we have to go. And then they smoke out a perfect line. Let's just not say that's everyone, okay? That is a very, very, very small fraction of the crew. Hannah's point is super spot on. A lot of this stage in paddling is about group dynamics and specifically you not destroying them. So if you are a good member of the crew, the crew will make leeway for your advancement because they're investing in you. They want to see you get better because they know when you get better, they're not going to be doing this special treatment anymore. But if you require so much special treatment that you break down the group dynamic to where it no longer functions, you're not getting invited back. Don't look for that phone call. I think another thing that you can do to help yourself and something that I'm still working on is failing gracefully. Um, because you are going to swim. That just comes with the territory of stepping up. And your crew should recognize that about you. They should, like you said, make leeway for the fact that you're stepping up and be understanding about it. But if you do swim, do what you can to help collect your own gear. Thank the people who drag you to shore. Just some of those little things can go a long way. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really the small things. Like, we had um, a couple of years ago someone where it wasn't even actually our group, right? Our group rolled up on another group who was having a team swim. And <laughs> it was just, and we wound up diffusing the situation. And it was like, dude, it's, it's 30 degrees out. It's windy. I know that you're winded and you're having trouble, you know, draining your boat or whatever it is. But like, there's now a dozen people waiting on you and we're all cold too it, it only takes one or two bad experiences for you to really kind of get written off by a large number of people so the more graceful you can be the better off it's going to be at the end of the day everyone's going to have a certain amount of patience because everyone has been where you are right now and had to struggle through but they still are going to expect you to experience this moment with grace. And if there's anyone out there who's just straight up making you feel bad for completely understandable mistakes. Screw that guy. Yeah, there's tough love and then there's being a bad person and know how to know the difference and don't anchor yourself to a bad person as a teacher. Yeah, don't pull some nonsense like paddling up and telling someone, oh, it's not a good place to swim, bud. Like... They're here. It happened. Be cool. There's no good things coming to you for bad river karma. All right. That's all that I had on my list of how to jump from class three to class four. Do you think there's anything else we didn't talk about? Yeah. I mean, I would say that like at this point, what we haven't said is that it's also cool if it's not for you. Don't don't pigeonhole your own success and your own experience on the river based on what other people do. I mean, there are any number of amazing competition playboaters out there, slalom kayakers out there, other people enjoying the river in their own way that don't want to risk getting hurt, don't enjoy free fall, don't whatever. So if you want to take another avenue in your the experience in the sport and this isn't for you there are so many other ways to enjoy the water all right well thanks for listening to another episode of getting better and we'll catch you on the next one see you at our training camps and don't forget to like and subscribe later guys